Uh, good afternoon. On behalf of the department, I welcome our guest speaker. Uh, he's a principal scientist uh, from ICR IOIR uh, Hyderabad. We are grateful to him accepting our uh, guest speaker uh, guest speaker for giving the title on adaptation and uh, mitigation tactics in oil field crops under aerobatic stresses. A step toward climate resilience. Uh, his contribution is uh, more in uh, scientific advancement, mainly in oil seed crops. Uh, identified uh, characterized uh, several uh, oil seed crops for uh, mainly under drought and uh, rainbow situations. Uh, he completed three projects and also gone going projects in the institution projects around seven, uh, which are in uh, Sasan, Sarflower, and other oil seed crops. He also has external projects. Uh, three uh, projects uh, from, from, from Gate Foundation and the DBT. So he also published a peer reviewed publication in peer reviewed journals, uh, book chapters. Uh, he recognized several awards uh, in review editor in plant physiology and outstanding scientist award, uh, member of a scientific advisory committee in the DBT big scheme, Barack DBT, and also received RD Asana gold medal during nine, uh, 2014. He's also a reviewer in uh, some of the journals. So I invite uh, guest speaker for a uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind words. Yeah. Uh, you can stop me in between if, whenever you feel. Um, it's not like a talk, it's a like, di discussion or debate. Uh, so I'm Dr. Ratna Kumar Pasala. I'm a principal scientist and at Indian Institute of Oil Seed Research, Hyderabad. Uh, we work on oil seeds. Oil seeds are our mandate crop to work on. Being a physiologist, uh, I should work on abiotic stresses and physiological metabolisms that involve in uh, abiotic stress and uh, normal conditions also. So today my talk lecture is on adaptations and mitigation tactics on oil seed crops and abiotic stresses. That's a major abiotic stresses I'm covering here. Uh, a step towards um, climate, res Hi. climate resilience. So, first of all, uh, I thank the uh, Department of Crop Physiology for inviting me for this guest lecture. Uh, I, I ask, I request you all to be involved. Uh, whenever you feel, uh, if you are not able to understand, you draw, you stop me in between, especially students. Uh, so, you are a physiologist. It means you are the uh, one who understand better than other disciplines, who understand the plant better than the other disciplines. So you understand the mechanisms, you know what to, uh, what should be the uh, adaptations of the plant, what are the survival tactics, what are the tolerant tactics. You know the difference between the survival and tolerance? Students. You know Opantia? It grows under desertic conditions also. Is it a tolerant or survival? So you have uh, uh, varieties from released from TNAU uh, that are working well under rain fed conditions and drought conditions. That, uh, that is a tolerant or survival? That one susceptible. I mean uh, survival. Tolerant. So tolerant in terms of what? Quantifying so in terms of what? Yeah, somebody is coming out. Come, tell. In terms of yield, the economic yield in terms of uh, that which consider mostly as a tolerant, uh, which is better for farming in terms of yield under any abiotic or biotic stress condition. So these are the for your information. I just put these uh, these flowers, which are uh, nine uh, oil seed crops. Other than these plantation uh, crops, oil palm, coconut also there. So these are the nine oil seed crops which we work in uh, uh, our at, at our institute. Sunflower and the soya bean, mustard, uh, groundnut, sesame, chapsa. These are soft flower. Linseed, have you heard about? Linseed and Niger. Niger, you know? So how to say in Tamil? In, huh? Stingle. 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 Stingle.
lesser uh, uh, seed uh, like uh, uh, sunflower. So my talk is on about introduction of the oil seed crop, impact of major abiotic stresses in oil seed crops, adaptations and of uh, oil seed crops to abiotic stresses, and mitigation strategies and way forward. So these are the edible oil seed crops. So on uh, top uh, seven, we consider as edible because we are consuming it day by day. Soybean, mustard, groundnut, sunflower, sesame, safflower, and niger. So nowadays people are using linseed also for edible purpose. We eat flax seeds, uh, flax, you know, fried flax seeds and flax seed oil also we use for different medicinal purposes. So why do I keep these three on the top? Because they are adding much to the uh, much uh, production to the oil seed oil uh, vegetable oil pt. So soybean, mustard, groundnut has greater area production and productivity compared to the lower four oil seed crop like sunflower, safflower, sesame, and niger. So these three are adding major contribution to the uh, vegetable oil pt. And the remaining also adding in different uh, ratios. Non-edible is a castor one. In Tamil Nadu also we grow castor. And clean seed, I don't know whether they grow in Tamil Nadu, but it grows in uh, most of the north and uh, some part of Karnataka, some part of Andhra. Not moving. Yeah. So to bring your attention, so we are importing per year one lakh forty one thousand crores of oil, vegetable oil, from foreign countries, especially from Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia. You know we are growing oil seed. We are going. We are we are producing our oil seed. Uh, I mean we are producing our vegetable oil. So. You know how much uh, per person per capita they are consuming of vegetable oil per year? Our forefathers they used to consume around five to six kgs. Now we are consuming eighteen kgs per person per capita because of our modernization. We want everything fried, biryanis, and fried on uh, fried potatoes, and fried everything. We are, we got modernized. It doesn't mean that we should use, we should consume more of more oil, isn't it? You just check uh, at your home how much oil you are using, whether it's gingerly, whether it is sunflower, or whether it is groundnut. So these three major oils we use in Tamil Nadu, Andhra, mostly in south. Gingerly we use more, more sunflower in Tamil Nadu, in uh, Telangana and uh, Andhra we use more sunflower. Gingerly we use for only for pickles. Preparation and all, and uh, soft flour also we are using soft flour in terms of safol oil, kusum kusum winter Tamil. Yeah, so we have our modernization improves our consumption of oil. That's the reason whatever we are producing, it's not easy, uh, sufficient enough for our purpose. Other than that, we are importing the one lakh forty one thousand crores of oil from different countries. Soybean oil, especially. So we are one way we are stopping the GM crop. Other way we are importing the soybean GM soybean oil. We don't know that it's not a, they they were marked as a GM soybean oil, but if you go to Europe and uh, uh, the other countries so where soybean predominantly grows, they are GM soybean crop. GM GM soybean. Why oil prices got increased recently? Main reason, Russia and Ukraine war, where sunflower, uh, Ukraine grows sunflower predominantly. So these are that uh, oil seed production in terms of million tons, uh, domestic oil production, uh, import of oil, uh, million tons, 14.07 million tons we are importing. And the value is 1,41,000 crores. So what to do? So this is the one oil seed production and uh, edible oil production in last seven years and uh, uh, targets for the next uh, uh, three years. We have one oil uh, um, commission board. 
NMOP, National Mission on Oil, Oil Production Produce, at a, it is situated at Delhi. So we have uh, this year we have uh, edible oil uh, uh, almost 8.97 million tons we produce, and we have target of 13.63 tons for 20, 25, and 26. How to how to go grow with that? When you compare the area, area is not increasing because of the cash crop. Farmer doesn't want to go. If he has a much uh, limit, if he has a source of water, he go with the paddy. But now, uh, for other crops, for curry, they go for maize. For rabi, they go for chickpea. But MSP of the oil seeds are, compared to them, it's very good. For sesame, uh, uh, it is MSP is around uh, 5,800. When compared to the paddy, it's 2,000 around. But still, farmer want to go with cereals and pulses. But the area is not increasing. Production is almost the same, like 0.2 million tons increasing every year. Yield almost similar. There's no big jump on the yield, but we have big, big. Uh, I mean, uh, targets. This is not my story. This is the one we have at present. India has. The target. Those who are working on oil field. Okay, how to overcome this? So I'm just presenting the area production productivity of oil seeds. Uh, for this was the estimations of 2020, 20, 20, 1920, where the, as as I said, soybean, rapeseed, uh, rapeseed mustard, and groundnut, they are contributing a lot. So they are special institutes uh, situated in India for these three crops. Separate institutes are there. You know that where the soybean institute is at, indoor, and rapeseed mustard, Bharatpur, it, it is in Rajasthan, and groundnut in Junagadh, it's in uh, uh, Gujarat. So remaining all oil seed crops we are taking care of. We are the major players in uh, remaining oil, uh, other oil seed crops. So where they are contributing quite a good uh, proportion of the vegetable oil city. So before that, in nowadays you are talking about the climate resilience. What is climate resilience? Why, why we have not, not we are not having a uh, one variety which is um, suitable, which is which can be fit into the all drought conditions. Nature, why we have location specific varieties are hybrid. Why not natural specific varieties are hybrid? Yeah, students, I'm just expecting you. Uh, SARS all know the, the faculty, they know much. I, I just want my physiology students to be strong and uh, they should be, you know, they should not feel that I uh, did you know, not for because of choice. I got into the chance if I got into that, not my choice like that. Why? What is the climate resilience? Why we have not natural? Uh, um, specific varieties are in hybrid because any abiotic stress that depends on the severity, duration, and the stage of the crop that exposed to, and climate and weather differences, you know, that particular region to region it varies. That's why that's the reason we have location specific varieties and hybrids rather than the natural wide, natural wide. Okay. So nowadays we are talking about climate resilience. Uh, last year, Modi ji uh, released almost 35 biofortified and uh, climate resilience uh, um, varieties, uh, varieties in our crop. There's a one Mumbin variety released by the Modi ji. It was uh, six, within 60 days it gets to physiological maturity. You know the physiological maturity, right? So. How to overcome that whatever the climate change, I mean, consequences. You are, my and your role is important to address those climate resilience things, where physiologists is required. Not only physiologists, agronomists, and other, 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 all multidisciplinary team, but we are, our role is big there. So be proud that we are going to tackle a big thought. 
like climate resilience. Okay, so move on to that. You know the potential yields and realized yields. You know the potential yields. Uh, yields. So you, that means you are sleeping, or you are, you are not able to understand my. <laughs> Shall I come in? Because some are there online. That's why I'm using mic. Otherwise, I have come into the group. Sorry. The crop that un, un, in favorable conditions that can give a yield in all favorable conditions that can be that what is the exact amount of yield that can be given is a potential yield. The one and the stress conditions is the realized yield. Yield losses by drought is five folds and other abiotic stresses. You know that. So drought is a major abiotic stress, but 70 to 75 percent of the potential yields. Uh, needs to be, uh, I mean, it's a big challenge for us to look uh, look under the rain-fed conditions because most of our uh, agriculture depends on the rain-fed e ecosystem. So you know all major abiotic stresses that are uh, um, that are affecting the oil seed, not only oil seed crops in other crops also. So cold stress, drought, heat, light, salinity, hypoxia, heavy metals. So there are almost about 35 abiotic stresses are there, that which are directly or indirectly affecting the crop, crop productivity and yields. So what is phenotype? So how we address this climate resilience? Being a physiologist, we need a better phenotype that with with a good, uh, I mean, genetic background, with good potential yields that can be fit into the abiotic stress conditions. So phenotype, this is not my equation. This is an equation that, uh, before my birth, the Pashura, <laughs> Pashura, he, defi he, he, he defined that uh, equation. He's still alive. He's there in uh, 90 plus, that, uh, he's still alive in Australia. So, so he's the one uh, who defined that uh, yields are depends of what, depend on water use, a uh, transmission efficiency, and harvest index. Nowadays, the people have used this management also. So yields are dependent on the water use and the transpiration efficiency or water use efficiency and harvest index plus management tactics of crop. So come to, coming to the all, uh, uh, I mean, oil seed uh, crops, I'm coming one by one. So groundnut, uh, groundnut are majorly cultivated in uh, under rain fed conditions, high area is there, production is there, productivity is there. There are uh, different groundnut varieties that are ruling, you know, Kadri 6, Kadri 9, uh, even your TMV, Tamil Nadu, Timdivana varieties are there. So they are ruling now. So, so they are what traits can be looked into as a physiologist, as a uh, scientist who is working on related to climate resilience. So as roots of the primary organs that are affected by the drought or any abiotic stress that, uh, that uh, arises from the soil. So we can look into the root functional traits, structural traits. We can look into the functional and structural traits. So I'm I'm, I just concentrated on roots, uh, structural traits. This is the work which we have, I have done at ICRISAC. So even uh, Dr. Janik Raman is initiated in Sorgam uh, with the mini lysimeters. So there, uh, we initially try to look into the structural traits of the roots. Structural traits in the sense root length, root length density, root volume, root length uh, density per volume of the soil, root angle, uh, seminal roots, main roots. So many things will come into that. So we have uh, extracted the roots and the roots were segmented into the different, uh, different uh, segments like um, 0 to 30 centimeters uh, depends on the scanner that you are uh, you have available and uh, we have scanned those roots and uh, those roots were analyzed how these root um, root length density or root length or root volume that contributing to the our yield final yield as we learn tolerance it depends on the yield of the particular crop or variety or hybrid okay so with this uh, we could not got much, we, much. Uh, I mean, uh, correlation or relation in between this uh, root length or root length density. We got relation, but it's minimal. 
then we thought what really triggering this only the root structures are if root structures are not really working what other thing when we looked into the root functionality so root functionality in terms of water water use or water uptake or transpiration so how that that can be addressed then that time in 2008 uh 2007 uh, we have developed the lysimetric facility at uh, it is a mini lysimetric facility at ikrisat still it is there there is now it is expanded it is expanded depends on the crop so for cereal uh very big crops are being used uh this is this is a mini lysimetric system and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, measured those transpiration or water uptake by uh, by mulching those uh, soil surfaces so that plant only can transfer so what you know what is the efficiency definition what are the component that we consider in the uh, while calculating water is efficiency sorry you are telling right come up transpiration evaporation plus photosynthesis the amount of water used for the amount of biomass production or production whatever so the amount of water in terms of transpiration in terms of evaporation so that all should be considered while you are calculating water efficiency while in case of transpiration efficiency we we restrict the uh, evaporation factor by mulching of certain mulches polythene beads or polythene paste tissues and all that so there only we are estimating the transpiration and water uptake so there we consider it is as a transpiration efficiency rather than the water use efficiency transpiration efficiency is a surrogate trick of water use efficiency okay so then we looked into the uh, genotype the performance so you can look you can see this uh, graph where the total water uptake from 0 to 21 days this is the one they grabbed much of water they uptake water through the transpiration but when it compares the pod yield they are negative 0 to 21 days uh, after this uh, i mean that that the flowering stage that indicates during the flowering stage the groundnut crop whatever the transpire that is not affecting the seed yield that is not correlating the seed yield when we looked at the 21 24 days to 56 days this, this is the one we got very good correlation so structural traits are not contributing much when we looked into the functional traits functional traits also within the functional traits also that depends on the crop stage again flowering stage that water whatever it uptake up it is not contributing to your seed yield when it is coming to the seed filling stage or seed formation stage that is contributing to the much of, uh, that is having strong correlation with the strong relationship with the pod yield that is what we understood in groundnut and in groundnut there are some of the finding that plants uh, tend to produce more the more root system what than what it requires in some entries we got very good root system but is not uh, it is not correlating with the seed yield that is what they said it is genetically uh, genetically operated it produces a root system than what it requires so in case of brown it's not same in all crops you just uh, remember that these are published work i need not to go so we we have uh, quantified the water uptake in between the popula- in the populations of different uh, parental groups you can see the uh, drought stress how much water uptake they took place but in case of irrigated conditions they took double than the drought stress conditions where the parentals are uh, standing far away in case of the lower graph so you can you can estimate how the parental performance parents performing under stress conditions how their the uh, f6 f5 generations are uh, generation population is performing what is the variation of uh, between the drought stress water uptake and the irrigated water uptake so so many things we can do. you can you can calculate with this uh, function uh, lysimetric facility so i just i was just talking about the transpiration efficiency transpiration efficiency is the interplay of photosynthesis and transpiration this is not my slide i slide this slide i slide i borrowed from somebody else uh, for better understanding i'm just 
brought this slide. I just brought this slide. Uh, translation efficiency, we consider the trans one of the target rate of water efficiency. We are measuring the transpiration. How we are calculating the transpiration is the transpiration efficiency is what? The amount of water used for the amount of biomass production. So how this amount of water used for the biomass production is a in physiological terms I'm explaining here. It's a uh, interplay of this photosynthesis and transpiration. It's not a pH, it's a PN. So when you look at whenever the transpiration took place, the amount of water transpired by the time of amount of carbon carbon dioxide fixed by the plant. This is a transpiration and photosynthesis that takes together. How you decide this is this is the low, low, low transpiration efficiency, how high transpiration efficiency. When you come, when you look at the low transpiration efficiency, here you see here. The amount of water molecules are going more, but the amount of carbon molecules are fixing less. We don't want this sort of this. We want the lines. You can see that where the amount of water molecules almost similar, the amount of carbon fixation. So that's where we consider they are the high transpiration line. Okay, so you need not to measure the photosynthesis. You are measuring the transpiration efficiency. The photosynthesis is our one more trade. So that photosynthesis says whether it really translocated to your CD, CD yield or not, you can check by the correlation of transpiration efficiency and your CD yield. You got it. Okay, so that's what we did even. We have not measured the photosynthesis. We have measured the for transpiration, transpiration efficiency, and we correlate the transpiration efficiency with the CD yield, and we got very good correlation with the under irrigated and stress conditions even. This is the ground light, the ground light lines we have evaluated. This is all the work that it's already published. We can see the with that you can you can clearly say that this is the amount of what carbon fixed that is used for the amount of pot production or the seed production. Okay, so based on that, we have evaluated different uh, germplasm uh, populations and breeding material at different locations also to identify the location across the to uh, identify the variety across the location or the germplasm across the location. For our interest, these are the these are the experiments conducted at Africa and India together at different locations at different years. For interest, we got very few lines which are fit for the both locations. This is a uh, PCA graph which is explaining here. The Sador is a one African location, then the Patanjaru is at decrease height. Very interesting, very few lines are there which are fitting into the both locations. That's what I'm saying that whatever the lines we are looking for, the climate resilience is one location specific rather than the national or international one. One more, one more uh, trait we look we, we, we are interested to look into that is canopy temperature. So you must have this. Nowadays, uh, you, if you go to the airport and uh, or even in metro or in a railway station, you check uh, during the corona, they'll check whether body your body temperature. The similar thing in plants. How it plays, as I said, uh, the canopy temperatures, if a plant is uh, cooler, it is transpiring well, it maintains a canopy, cooler canopy. If it is closed from ATA, it, the temperature is automatically built up. Like how we feel after the uh, fever goes from our body. So we are feeling like sweating. That's how we relate, we try to look into this. This is the one of the uh, technology we use, uh, but it is a bit uh, costlier. The, the thermal cameras we used uh, to pick, cap, grab the picture at one, one uh, stroke. Complete, uh, uh, complete field. So after that, we analyzed using different uh, software. So how this uh, you know, entries are varying for the canopy temperatures and the drought condition. What are the lines that are cooler canopy temperatures that maintaining under drought condition? How that canopy temperature will uh, uh, link with the seed yield or uh, pod yield. 
So if the lines which are cooler can be around 24 degrees, they are with high seed yielders. The lines which are with the 27, 28 degrees are lesser, I mean, uh, uh, less pod yielders. That's where canopy temperature also one of the uh, trades that really playing important role. And now recently, CIMET has uh, released one of the variety uh, based on the canopy temperatures that Matthew, Matthew Ronald there released that one. So not only canopy temperature, there's all the physiological parameters, agronomic parameters, we look into the molecular level, QTL level, uh, how they're expressed, uh, whether they're really contributing to this uh, at, at a chromosome level or uh, QTL level, but we got very less, uh, I mean, uh, uh, potato ketogenic, we could not got much QTLs for different physiological parameters. We need to look into the in-depth, uh, really whether these uh, uh, physiological parameters are agronomical traits that contributing or drought. But in case of grounded, we've not got much tutorials uh, for physiological traits. But in case of chickpea, uh, there's a one, one QTL that's performing for a root length density. It's have a high region on the, on the chromosome 8 in chickpea. That was a big achievement at the side. So when it comes to sesam, so sesam you call it jimjili. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, 5,700 accessions at IAOR, Indian Institute of Oil Seed Research. They are deferred from for their uh, um, morphological traits, branch insights, leaf area, um, leaf area, and uh, the capsule number of capsules that forms a multi single capsule or multi capsule per axis, uh, number of low, low uh, I mean, uh, uh, different. Uh, types of colors we have. So why I presented here is, being a physiologist, we look into that, there's a source variation among the germplasm. Source in terms of leaf area, in terms of photosynthesis, in terms of uh, their uh, angle to receive the uh, light penetration, uh, and they adapted to that particular condition. We have source variation. Especially in SESAM, if you look at that, if you grow the plant at the vegetative stage, we have a very good leaf area. The moment it grows up, the leaf area gets narrowed. So then photosynthesis or photosynthesis get limited to this particular sink in terms of capsule or seed. So that conditions how we do. What are what you recommend to the breeders to go for breeding? What do you recommend to the farmers? to go for cultivation. So there's a big gap, big, uh, mm, I mean, gap between the source and sink. So these are one of the things we, we need, really need to look into that. So we are working on that uh, aspect also. So we have a different, uh, we are conducting different experiments and field levels because we are working directly to the farmers, uh, our pot cultures and all, uh, but student level is okay, but uh, uh, at uh, uh, scientist level and uh, for application oriented, if we can demonstrate in the field level, then only farmers will accept that. So they, we have done different experiments. This is the one uh, sensors I, I was discussing about. So this is the one real-time soil moisture sensor, um, which is equipped with solar panels, and you will get uh, continuous soil moisture, soil temperature, uh, ambient temperature and humidity. Based on that, you can let, check your uh, soil moisture levels of the soil, different depths of the soil uh, at particular uh, location. Uh, how much you can maintain the soil moisture, how, when you can, you have to irrigate, when you have to relieve the stress. Sesame is a peculiar crop that grows in three seasons. Curry, majorly it, it grows in classic curry, national level. But it grows in a Rabi and Jaid also, like January sowing. In Telangana and all, they do January sowing. We have uh, worked on functional traits and uh, structural traits of roots. So uh, we have used different root structures, poly bags to extract the root and look at that root uh, contribution to the yield. And we have identified some of the lines and uh, they, we have registered with those lines with the NBPGR for particular root rates and drought. And uh, these are, this is the data you will get uh, by using this sensor. These are the real-time soil moisture sensors developed by IIT Mumbai. So with this, uh, you can get the real-time data 
how much it is there at the time of uh, you are uh, um, sowing to complete harvest. This is the difference between the um, irrigated and the uh, press plot. So initially we give one or two irrigations like a farmer, what they do whenever the rain comes and whenever the water availability, they go for sesame sowing. After that, they, there would be no rain or irrigation. The crop get exposed to the thermal drought or intermittent drought. That conditions how plant grows. So these are the uh, uh, values of soil moisture metric for in metric potential. So you can see here minus five bars up to minus five bars crop can grow. Crop can tolerate. Beyond that, crop gets fried. These are the lines which are identified based on the root traits. So as I said, uh, we have we are using a uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, poly, uh, polythene beads as a mulch for the transpiration efficient study. These are white polythene beads that applied uh, that mulched on the surface of the soil to control the evaporation, and we allow the plant only to transpire. So this is uh, uh, one uh, paper recently published in Act of Physiology Plantarum, uh, so where we have looked into the different uh, uh, segments of the roots, how they are contributing, but we could not got any interesting results there, how their uh, segments of the roots uh, contributing to the yield. But in case of the transpiration efficiency, when we looked at the different, uh, uh, I mean, transpiration efficiency seed yield, we got very good correlation with even with harvest index also. So these are the lines again uh, we are uh, um, using as a parental material for breeding purpose. So leaf potassium, you know potassium, how it plays in the stomatal movement. You all know, right? So we consider one of the trait as a leaf potassium uh, that contributes a drought tolerance in sesame. So we have used uh, different uh, populations to quantify the leaf for potassium. So we got a very good uh, response here for the leaf potassium also. Look, the, the lines which are with the high leaf potassium, they are having with high transpiration efficiency also. Those lines we have uh, identified and uh, they, they are uh, about to uh, register uh, right. this year. So not only the other, uh, these physiological traits, we look into the agronomic traits also like uh, leaf area, seed, seed yield, and uh, plant height, uh, different uh, physiological traits like uh, uh, related wa relative water content, uh, other um, transpiration, transpiration efficiency, photosynthesis, and all. We looked into that, that, that uh, correlation of those traits among the genotypes. So how does the genotype fit into that uh, particular um, combination of the traits, uh, combination of the traits under uh, particular situation. These are all the published data. Recently, we published in plant frontiers and plant census. Along with that, we looked into the genetic diversity also. Not only physiological, agronomical, or biochemical thing. We looked into the genetic diversity also. We have uh, used almost 120 SSR markers to identify the genetic diversity at different, uh, different under different uh, situations. Uh, for our interest, uh, the, there is no much polymorphism we have observed in Sasam because this is Sasam self pollinated crop, highly self pollinated crop. We could not see much polymorphism and uh, uh, among the lines which we have uh, evaluated by using SSR markers, we got four uh, different populations. Out of the uh, four different populations, second group is the one of which where promising lines were identified. So not only this, uh, you are doing, you have done physiologically, agronomically, or molecular things. So next step is to take into the farmer's field. So we have AACRC centers, so where we do multi-location trials, uh, whether our identified lines that can be for farmer. Uh, whether in other conditions, other ACRT centers also or not. So we have evaluated, we have uh, evaluated different locations at different years also. We got very good interesting lines, which is the one, uh, this is the germplasm line, uh, which is the one which high pubescence on the capsule, high pubescence on the stem, uh, and the thick leaves, succulent leaf type of one, which is um, good for biotic and abiotic cells as well. And uh, some of the lines which are uh, 
with lesser capital with capital less capital size but no more number of capital particularly under stress conditions so these lines are identified and this is the one line which is released into 2021 cbrc uh, uh, this is developed along with the breeders of zegital uh, center at telangana uh, so this is called jcs 2454 where uh, yields are uh, uh, 970 to 1030 kg per hectare and this is a white seed white seed and one and generally in the, uh, tamil nadu they prefer black seeds and the andhra they prefer brown seeds and telangana and some part of uh, this one uh, they prefer white seed it depends on their uh, um, preference of the particular farmers or the consumers so this is recommended for summer cultivation so uh, very good uh, yields with a good physiological basis of tolerance under stress conditions. Summer, con summer cultivation, they doesn't have much irrigation. With one and two irrigations, it is coming very well up. This is the one line which is uh, recently re released uh, for Telangana particularly. Uh, this is J JCS 10 uh, 1020. Uh, this is a line which is called monocolm line, the single stem line, which is Generally, in farmers, uh, I don't know about Tamil Nadu, uh, they broadcast the sun. They don't go for line sowing. They simply broadcast and they harvest at the end. They don't put much efforts also. So, for broadcasting purpose, uh, to maintain the high plant density uh, at the field level, so these lines, uh, these line was brought up, uh, and it was it is released for Telangana for uh, for 2022. Uh, this is high density uh, uh, line, monocolm line with uh, multi multi capsule per uh, per each uh, uh, axis. So uh, four to six capsules are there for each axis. So this is also fit under dry rain fed conditions. This is a 50% oil content is there. Sesame is considered as the queen of the oil field. Why? Because of its having high oil content among the all other field, other oil, oil seed, oil uh, crops. Up to 50, 60% oil content is there in Sesame. You can see the farmer, uh, you know, farmer's field, the performance of the particular line, which is really the last year at Telangana. So some of the lines which we have identified, this is DT in the sense drought tolerant, 112, drought tolerant 97. These are the lines uh, which are with uh, um, good um, uh, high seed yield uh, with high transpiration efficiency uh, under moisture stress conditions at 4.5 megapascals of high moisture conditions. These are about to release. Huh? Minus 4.5 bar, bar 600 megapascals bar. Yeah, safflower kusum uh, is the one uh, intra interesting crop with uh, uh, high oleic content. So we have a high oleic uh, content uh, uh, safflower also. You must have using that safola oil, right? Safola, uh, this is uh, where safflower is contributing in that particular oil. So uh, this is mostly farmers never prefer this because of this fine nature of the crop. Uh, so the crop area production is very less compared to other oil seed crops. It is going decrease uh, day, year and year. Uh, so we have a, uh, we have done different uh, experiments in uh, half lower, but uh, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, uh, most of the oil seed per se, they are considered as a drought tolerant. Per se, I'm using the word, but not, they are not. If you are talking about any cereals, and, oh, they are drought tolerant, they are abiotic stress tolerant, why, need to, why we have to work in that? But if you go and see in the real, real field conditions, they are not. The level of stress, the level of uh, uh, drought evaporation that was, there, that was there in those days, it is not the same nowadays. So the performance is different. Okay, so uh, be cautious about those uh, so-called uh, statements. They are not per se the drought tolerant or abiotic tolerance. So we have done some uh, experiments like uh, drawdown experiments. I just want to brought some of the slides. Uh, I'm not going into detail of that what we have done uh, large scale here in Safflower. 
so I just want to show this uh, on, uh, how this crop, which can, which is uh, grown in residual moisture conditions, soft flower grows in rubby condition, rubby season, especially in residual moisture conditions like chickpeas. They know they never irrigate. So if whenever that moisture grows down in the soil profile, that crop gets exposed to the stress. Obviously, that uh, the may the the month the crop entered into the February, the crop get exposed to the high temperatures also in Telangana and southern part of uh, India. So that conditions crop uh, performance and field conditions the obvious. So we have. Yeah. Uh, so they are the uh, these are the lines which are uh, germplasm uh, lines and uh, uh, ruling varieties. We uh, try to look at it. We try to look at. Uh, uh, the, the threshold levels of transpiration against the soil moisture content. Here, the normalized transpiration is the one of the transpiration that can be measured under a uh, fraction of transferable soil water. So you see here, these are the different uh, genotypes. Uh, these are the hybrid. A1 is a high, ISF is a variety. A1 is a variety. BMA is variety. And the GMU is the one which is a... a uh, which is the one uh, jump plasm. So the the variation of against the soil moisture, uh, how they are maintaining the transpiration. If you get some of their some of the condi some of the conditions the varieties, they are, can grow up to the. Uh, they dropped their transpiration at a 0.4 fraction of soil water uh, soil transferable water. Some of them can drop at 0.6. Some of them at 0.4. That's where you you will get clear cut variation. How the variety are the germplasm that performing against the soil moisture conditions. You can see the variation in where the GMU line. Some GMU lines are dropping at uh, 4.4. Some GMU lines are dropping at 0.66 even. Where 68-2 is the one considered as a um, moderately tolerant to the drought. It is also dropping at 0.7 fraction of transferable soil water. It clearly gives how plant modulate the transpiration against the available soil moisture at particular situation. So we have a, we are conducting different uh, experiments at field levels also, and we look at the root structures by digging the soil. It's a it's a laborious work. Uh, it could not be possible here for you students, but it's for your information. I brought these slides. So we look at the different field uh, at different depths of the field level, how, but how the root angle plays particular uh, conditions, how the root angle contributing seed yield, how how much root depth can go into this uh, soil at particular situation of this stress. So we have using these uh, these are the sensors at different depths, how the soil moisture. Uh, Soil moisture recorded, and we are using the canopy temperatures also. This is a hyperthermal camera. This is one of my students. He is now working as an assistant professor in uh, uh, University of Agriculture uh, College at uh, Varangal. Uh, so initially, we get pictures like this uh, when you use the, uh, this uh, thermal camera by uh, removing the background of this particular picture. You can analyze the temperature variations. You can see the variation of the temperature from which is in foreign foreign degrees, foreign degrees. So you can see the variation of the particular lines under field condition. Based on that, you decide your temperature temperature and look at the uh, um, look at the relation with the yield, and you can go for the selection of particular entries. 
So you have you heard about the canopy temperature depressions? The temperature difference between the ambient temperature and the plant canopy temperature. So we, are, but again, the that la, that varieties that differ from at the stage wise that canopy temperature depressions. At flowering stage they are different. At seed seed filling stage they are different. You can see here. These are the varieties. These are the GMU alliance and the Jan blossom lines. So where the tem temperatures are cooler, that is why they are plus side. When the temperatures are uh, above the, I mean uh, this one, uh, ambient temperature, they are in minus side. So these are the lines which are uh, cooler at this um, flowering stage, vegetative stage. When it comes to flowering stage, very few are there. Again, while this is also one of the factor while you are deciding any selection or any phenotype that fit into the field conditions. So these are all the factors we need to be considered when we are selecting particular entry for such particular stress conditions. So the lines, uh, the different traits with their association and the stress conditions, are they, especially in deficit soil, uh, soil moisture stress. So these are the lines how it differs from the uh, one another for particular conditions, particular traits we have quantified. Along with that, we have a uh, uh, this is the one uh, project we have from uh, funded from DBT. This is a network project. Uh, we are the leading group in that. Uh, it is uh, funded around 19.8 crores um, mm, to our institute, where JNU and uh, Akola, Delhi University, also one of our network partners. So we have uh, we are looking at uh, uh, resistant to aphids also in South Florida. Aphids are the one of the second pests. Uh, that generally occurs in soft flower. Why he brought uh, this epid uh, biotic stress into the abiotic stress? You might you may be thinking in that. So where our physiologist roles are important. So you can see here the lines we we identify two phytotic PDLs here that are contributing to the stress. I mean uh, epid tolerance in um, this one soft flower. You can see here these are the lines which are tolerant. Some are lines are knocked out by the epid searching. These lines are not uh, emitting. I mean, they are not uh, avoiding aphid. They are feeding aphid, but they are surviving. Aphids are there on that on that particular line, but they are surviving. They are green. They are giving some amount of yield. Why? If they are really, uh, I mean, avoiding the aphids by producing any secondary mode of life, it's not happening there. Aphids are completely feeding on them. They are happy in the on that on those plants, but still these lines are highly for stay green, photosynthesis highly performing um, physiological parameters, and producing some yields, not fully yields, some yields. So what? How you define being a physiologist? How you how you your role you 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 play here? So for our interest, if a interesting thing is. We could able to see the lines which high photosynthesis value, high photosynthetic uh, performance, and high photosynthate accumulation than what it required. They are, they are producing the photosynthates for the epid purpose and for the survival purpose, for the tolerance purpose. Where other lines are knocked out, they could not even do much of the photosynthesis. They are very with less for photosynthesis. They, they could not feed themselves and they could not give to effects even. And some are lead we got. We, we are looking into that. Still, that work is on. And uh, um, probably, most probably, I will share those results soon. So these lines able to produce the photosynthesis or photosynthesis are maintaining their biomass, stay green by feeding the epids as well. In the sense they are doing more than double, triple this one. OK, so this is about the uh, soft law. When it comes to sunflower, sunflower uh, much work uh, we have initiated recently. And earlier people have done some of the work in sunflower by stopping the flower, not moving into the sun direction uh, by, uh, I mean, uh, Stopping the production of particular um, plant hormones, not moving to sign direction, how it really affects the yields and all. The Ukraine team has been done a lot of on that. Um, so I'm not going into those details. 
so the we have done we have identified lines based on their uh, root such uh, root uh, morphological and uh, especially morphological traits we considered here we have to look into the functional traits in this particular uh, in sunflower so sunflower water use efficiency is uh, more than the groundnut and rice so you can see the values are here even dr uday kumar used to appreciate this crop because of its use um, very well in terms of water use for the production of uh, carbon uh, carbon or photosynthesis so other traits also are taking care of the sunflower in uh, well um, gray flowers or uh, pollination is the biggest issue where we use the gibbering sprays for the pollination uh, for more uh, pollination in sunflower so one of the crop is called niger so is grown in only, only in tribal areas agencies agencies or hilly regions um, in uh, different parts of india especially in madhya pradesh andhra and varisa border varisa uh, where uh, they consider the yellow gold so if you go to the visakhapatnam aruku and all that places complete uh, hills are become yellow in term in, in the season of curry uh, late curry they they simply broadcast and they harvest It's a very good oil with medicinal purpose. Um, it's look, it's a like a look. The oil look like clarified. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, like ghee. But most of the tribal they use, and it is very good oil for medicinal purpose. The sunflower is a major problem with high, high temperatures during the flowering stage. Uh, then uh, cascuta is one of the major problem. So uh, I am uh, working as a nodal officer uh, for the uh, tribal sub plan in ICR. for a uh, state of andhra um, so where we have we have made some interventions to overcome the cascuta cascuta will completely devastate the crop 100% then high temperatures almost 50% yield losses will be there so we have recommended certain technologies to overcome the cascuta but tribals never follow that they do their own uh, technology by putting this uh, by soaking the Uh, seed uh, for a uh, 10 to 15 minutes in high salt concentration water, and they remove uh, with that high salt salt concentration. What happens? Uh, Cascuta seeds will die, and neither seeds uh, they use they go for sowing. So they do their indigenous uh, technology technical things. So still, our uh, some work is going on with the high temperature high temperature tolerance in uh, in neither. These are some of the things. And the castor. Uh, uh castor you know uh somebody asked me castor can grow besides the railway tracks also what is the need of doing uh, <laughs> what is the need of doing this much research and this much funding required is it required at uh, db dst <laughs> dst funding uh, i mean uh, when we are presenting the our presentation it can grow uh besides the railway tracks and besides our uh, houses and all that why is it required it requires a lot because we are the one exporters number one exporter in castor for uh, castor particularly uh, to china and brazil here the india is at number one in that and uh, this castor castor oil using uh, as a lubricant in many th- many industrial purposes uh, castor oil being used and um, i don't know about you guys in my, my childhood I, i used to get a castor oil uh, i mean head malice and all that so castor uh, but the major problem in castor is resinolic uh, oil resinolic component so we have developed the, uh, the lines which is uh, with resinol lesser lysonic uh, content and uh, um, different uh, i mean uh, different biotic and abiotic uh, tolerance also so here you can see different uh, uh, castor lines which we have identified rg14994 uh, rg298 and rg11826 uh, with these uh, field root structure and polybag screening not only with single screening with the different screenings we have identified and we confirm those lines which are performing better under field conditions so the lines which are growing uh, beside the railway track and all they are perennial type they can grow continuously but uh, the the varieties hybrids what we have it's almost 4 to 5 months crops maximum 5 5 5 one of months so those are with higher yield with high uh, amount of oil content they have so these are the lines under uh, and one more beauty in castor is um, they have a wax 
we call we call this a bloom. It's a bloom in a sense, not a flowering. In castor, we call, call bloom is a one of that. So they they if they have an uh, leaf one surface is called single bloom and leaf both surfaces double bloom. If it is has a stem also, it's called triple bloom. The bloom variations that occur under drought conditions. The lines which are we had which we identified are the two one three nine, which is having triple bloom uh, under drought conditions and it is performing well under uh, complete rain fed situation and drought conditions, terminal drought conditions. So this is all about nine crop. I could not cover the linseed uh, because we have not initiated much work in that. Okay, uh, what is what mitigation strategies can be done? So Vetrivel presented morning. Uh, he has used different uh, PGPR. People are using different uh, microbial microbial consortia to uh, um, alleviate or mitigate the drought stress or any abiotic stresses. Uh, different consortia. You you uh, your department has different boosters. Whether uh, uh, they are all for recommend irrigated conditions or drought conditions, I don't know. But uh, you have uh, your own uh, department uh, significant boosters. So why this mitigation is required? So I just want to bring your uh, attention. So we have a genetic department, plant breeding department. They are developing uh, varieties. They are developing hybrids, which can be fit into this. So why mitigations again required? So I, I just brought some of my opinion on that. It's a time consuming required. Now we got speed breeding and uh, those technologies earlier. It take away one variety. Uh, it requires a lot of time to uh, release six or five, six years minimum. Uh, and uh, uh, those lines may, may perform better here. And when it go to the field conditions, they may be different. So all centers, if we get the data, the all centers may not be the same. Some ten centers with the data, uh, multi-location data, uh, they are uh, lesser because of the many things. Some centers are you know, good uh, in uh, this one. So aggregate, we take that those values for release purpose. So this is a time consuming process. We need a mitigate, we need a direct solution to uh, minimize the yield losses. I'm using the word minimize. The yield losses in the farmer's field condition directly. Being a physiologist, what can be done? So why, how how best we can use is the standing crop that is experience that that is experiencing the stress, salinity, high temperature. So we need certain certain protection that can be built the inbuilt system that can be in that can improve the inbuilt system of the plant. So that is where our mitigation mitigators are PGPRs, are microbial consortias, are um, Millinga technology. They bought Millinga, Millinga in the one sense in French, it's called uh, composition, composition of different uh, different things. So those technologies, they are there in the market. So how best we can use them to improve, enhance the inbuilt system of the plant and in standing crop. There, the, these lines, these uh, mitigators play an important role. This, this is the one uh, which uh, we published in Ag uh, Advances in Agron in 2018 from Baramati uh, work. So some of the uh, some of the categories we classified into different uh, uh, based on their uh, chemical nature, chemical nature with constitution, structural compounds, hormonal base, and uh, microbial base, those all things. So these are almost we are using in different forms. So you can ask, uh, sir, H2S, NO, these are the uh, gaseous forms. Still people are using as a mitigator. These groups are using as a mitigators. So all silica and all they are in, uh, constituting structural components. It's all there in the plant. It's all there abundant in the system, in the uh, environment. You can ask one question, sir, silica is abundant. Why you are using silica components? To enhance the inbuilt system or to, uh, to uh, mitigate the uh, abiotic stresses in the crop, especially in poetry number, gramination number, or cucumber. Because the form of silica required for the plant is in the form of artho silicic acid. That required, that only can, plant only can uptake artho silicic acid. So, if we give any booster in the form of artho silicic acid, 
that works well that in that really trigger those um, genes that are that are there in uh, roots ls1 ls10 feng ma is one of the person who is about to get that nobel he is the one chinese scientist uh, i literally met him uh, two years back in uh, sweden uh, he is the one who is a pioneer of this silica work in rice yeah his group is working very well on the silica transporters how it silica transport from the root to the leaf level and what are the gene expressions particularly in rice they have done so this is the one of the unified mechanism we propose and it is published uh, so plant growth regulators are plant bioregulators we have, we call different uh, names so air regulators growth regulators plant promoting by uh, growth regulators or uh, any any form that once we use they they enhance the water uptake nutrient uptake i can see here nutrient uptake water uptake they modulate the redox mediate mechanism in terms of homeostasis maintaining the redox homeostasis and uh, uprooting and has the rooting system and has the source and sink relation and the state uh, on the anti accident improved anti accident status so that's where plant able to perform better under abiotic stress conditions this is also published uh, uh, in journal of uh, applied by botany and uh, uh, so this is german journal so the mechanism how it works really so it's regulated root growth by different uh, targeting different uh, plant uh, plant hormones like indolestic acid uh, auxin so uh, at heme proteins and your uh, beet uh, transcription factors i'm not going into details you can go through that and so on sync relations it improves and the redox modulated mechanism by uh, by uh, coordinating the formation of formation of atp and nddph so some of that uh, mitigation strategies that we are using and uh, people are using in the uh, oil seeds uh, the one say some uh, selenium spray 5 to 10 mg per liter uh, this is propolis extract you know the propolis extract the wax uh, mm, accumulated through the honey bee that being used as a uh, as a one of the uh, one of the uh, mitigator of the drought in sesam so while the honey bee makes the comb that they are there is a wax well they collect the uh, one that is the one of propolis propolis uh, extract and uh, nano cellulose material uh, one of our uh, colleague developed uh, based on the castor made castor uh, nano cellulose na castor cellulose material which is converted into nano cellulose material and there's a, there's also uh using as a seed prime that protects the plants from the wilt uh, as well as uh, it uh, it enhances the uh, i mean uh, seedling growth at at seedling stage as it is it is, it is under trials uh, we are doing that dr muri daran from tunu is helping us in that uh is a, is, a, is a seed priming one of the seed priming uh, we have used and groundnut uh, potassium nitrate and phosphate uh, one of the polyac spray we are using i know i don't know you were grown at boost or what it has um sunflower we have used boron applications borax plus zinc sulfide to for initiation of ray florets sunflower you know ray florets disflorets so for initiation of ray florets uh, we we use uh, borax to 0.2% borax and zinc sulfide and glycine betaine and salicylic acid uh, uh, also we use for the drought uh, elevation in the uh, under some in some flower in top lower zinc and uh, fe we use at 30 30 to 35 days and uh, mustard h2so4 uh, this is not our work this is uh, doing by bharatpur uh, people and so i have been canetin and salicylic acid salicylic acid we have used at uh, baramati it's really working well uh, in soybean under drought conditions especially even in water logging also salicylic acid working well nice uh, boric acid is uh doing bad best at uh, 60 days flowering one spray uh so these are the technologies uh, that have been brought up uh, at the time at nyasam uh, institute i am also involved in that so these are the uh, recommendation uh, these are the uh, quantities that we fix during uh, my stay there and we have uh, brought these technologies in different crops not the oil seed crops uh area 10 millimolar 
if you go beyond it, it's a carcinogenic again. And again, it's a spray. Uh, you should not go more than three sprays. At uh, one, we do at root crown stage of the wheat. Uh, after 14 days, the wheat can uh, wheat has a root crown stage. The crown of root will generate at that stage. Uh, so that is recommended, and the people are practicing there in Maharashtra. And sodium benzoate is one of the one uh, we use uh, for pea green uh, in flower gum. Some published work in agriculture water management uh, recently. Uh, the sorghum benzoate is a preservator. So generally we find in pickles that uh, process the pickles. So they, this is also working well uh, because I came for um, this. What reveals uh, <laughs> uh, why, uh, why uh, I brought this slide. This is a technology we brought in KNO3 uh, in uh, onion. You try this one if you have time. Uh, really, it, it is boosting the bulb quantity, bulb size. 10 O3, 100 mg per nine, 100 mg per liter, at three sprays. Vegetative and uh, after each 15 days intervals, it's really working well. And uh, Maharashtra farmers are using it. Uh, even Bima, Shakti, those entries are performing well to this uh, potassium nitrate. And salicylic acid uh, for brinjal, salicylic acid uh, for brinjal, uh, 10 microliter per liter. This is all uh, uh, cost benefit ratio we calculated, and these, uh, these are very, very much beneficial. So, way forward uh, identification of genetic material for specific abiotic stress. Not only identification, confirmation is required before you uh, uh, go for further uh, uh, things uh, like uh, rec uh, recommending to the breeders or uh, you are recommending to the farmers. It is confirmation always required by using uh, precise, rapid training methods. Nowadays, phenomics is uh, on um, behalf, and uh, we can, not only phenomics, you have a lot of uh, uh, tools that can be um, confirmed your material, whether really they, they have carry forward those drought tolerant, physiological and agronomical and molecular traits. And development of varieties by using conventional molecular biochemical markers, uh, and nowadays, metabolomics is one of the important things. And uh, conventional breeding, you know, they do conventional. Molecular breeding also one of the uh, things people are bringing the varieties and they're using molecular, molecular things. And validation uh, required. And not only this, uh, we required uh, the help of agronomists where they can bring the good uh, best management practices. So with all this, we can get certain um, entries for which which can be recommended for the drought or abiotic stress, any for high temperature stress uh, tolerance. So with this, I thank uh, DBT Safflower uh, Network Project DBT for uh, funding us for 19.8 crores to work on this particular uh, aspects in Safflower. Uh, so these are the, my students who have done their PhDs and masters um, with me for the past six and seven years. Thank you. Thank you, Vinandal, for your patient closing. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Hi, sir. Uh, yes, madam, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, so this is Vani. I'm audible. Yes, yes, madam, you are audible. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, kindly uh, share some interesting thing about uh, DAG, dry acyl glycerol, while in your research experience or in your team gone through the in oil seed crop, in oil seed crop. I didn't get you. Can you repeat that one? See, kindly share some interesting thing about DAG, dry acyl glycerol, in oil seed crop while in your uh, research experience madam uh, i have not used cg uh, in even uh, in other crops also uh, okay. so, uh, as of you ask me that uh, i can say nil in that okay. to be frank okay. nina to <laughs> give some mesmerizing things uh, i have no uh, information in cg as such because uh, it's uh, it's limiting factor in oil production in oil seed crop. Yes, 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 yes. We so have. That's why. Yeah, it's yeah. limiting in oil seed production, uh, production especially. 
so we have yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, one more thing sir uh, see can you um, share some point about see you mentioned in your slide for seed priming of nano cellulose material uh, for uh, drought mitigation yes so this uh, nano cellulose how it's um, i mean how it's related i mean how it's affect that uh, seed physiology or how it's related to seed physiology is there anything uh, uh, kindly share uh, one or two points yeah madam well, the preliminary work is initiated and uh, we brought uh, uh, along with nano cellulose we are using diff, uh, like uh, uh, some other material uh, which can increase the seed size because uh, seed we want to reduce the seed rate per acre that's the one major uh, thing and the other thing is uh, along with the uh, cellulose cellu you know that uh, cellulose material that uh, enhance the uh, i mean um, uh, moisture content uh, initial uh, along with that uh, cellulose content uh, we are using different uh, um, i mean nutrients also to so, uh, which we are using as a medium also for uh, yeah. medium also so yes. uh, with that uh, we can uh, we are think we are we are especially looking at that particular uh, water holding capacity and nutrient uptake at seedling level which can enhance the plant uh, i mean seedling vigor uh particularly mm -hmm. in uh, drought conditions so uh, these are preliminary works we initiated especially we are using the cellul cellulose component from castor background uh people are using mm -hmm. different backgrounds uh, castor has good amount of cellulose in the castor stem so that cellulose we could able to extract it and uh, we are using that particular thing to enhance that particular uh, especially nutrient and water uptake under uh, these conditions drought conditions Okay, so it's in the preliminary work. So we have to explore the what are the uh, I mean enzyme activities inside during germination physiology. We have to find out, right, sir? Yeah, yeah. So germination increased. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you that germination increased and physiological parameters, other physiological parameters, all already also improved compared to the one non non priming seeds, and uh, that material I'm not disclosing because we are uh, submitted to for patent. Correct. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I hope I, I am able to make you understand. If you have any questions, you can contact me directly. Huh? So, on behalf of the Department of uh, Crop Physiology, I thank Dr. Ratan Kumar Pasala, uh, Principal Scientist from IAOR Hyderabad, for coming over here. And giving a wonderful, excellent uh, talk, sir. And uh, he just gave beautiful photographs talking on physiology, QTLs, mitigation. Uh, I think it was holistic and uh, it was the need of the hour. And I think the students' uh, interaction was also very well, which showed that it was a really excellent and wonderful lecture. Thank you, sir, for coming over here and giving your uh, uh, lecture as well as conducting the Viva Ose. Uh, finally, I also would like to thank uh, the Dean SPGS uh, for uh, creating this guest lecture series. And it is an innovative and a sparkling idea of our Dean SPGS uh, to make all the uh, external examiners to give a speech so that we all get well equipped in different uh, arenas of research. Uh, and also for uh, all the logistics that has been provided from the Dean office. And uh, next, I also would like to extend my thanks to our director, uh, Crop Management, who has always been supporting us, being a physiologist. It's really, uh, uh, we are gaining momentum with all her uh, support to conduct these type of lectures. And uh, though Head is not here, he has been coordinating it from um, his two program and the PG coordinator for all the efforts to conduct this and all my other colleagues and students for participating and making the seminar uh, uh, more beneficial one for all of us. Thank you. Thank you to one and all.